This talk is about interoperative monitoring of peripheral nerves. This talk will be conducted in a question and answer format. The first question is, the classification most often used to talk about muscle sensory innervation is the dash classification. A. Gazer, B. Lloyd, C. Cutaneous nerve, D. Motor. Of the four most often used classifications, the Gazer classification can be used to classify all nerves peripheral and cranial, autonomic or regular, motor or sensory, and all their modalities. This classification was addressed in a prior video devoted to cutaneous stimulation. At this point, I like to emphasize that type A fibers, those myelinated, and especially those one most myelinated, that is, the type A alpha and beta fibers are very sensitive to pressure and stretching and hypoxia, whereas C fibers are most sensitive to local anesthetics. B fibers are not shown here. They are present only in humans in preganglionic elements of the sympathetic nervous system. The Lloyd classification is most often used for muscle sensory fibers, but it can also be used for all sensory modalities. The cutaneous nerve classification is based on a mixture of factors such as the receptor organs the fibers serve, mechanical characteristics, and the presence or absence of myelination, and also based on function. The motor classification is restricted to muscle motor fibers. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The fascicles in the nerves are formed by the dash. A. Endonerium. B. Perinerium. C. Epinerium. D. None of the above. Using the light microscope to look at nerves, we see all myelinated axons and myelinated axons. All myelinated and myelinated axons are covered by endonerium. This layer is made of collagen and vessels and serve as a conduit for the axons. The endonerium is particularly thin at the level of the roots. The axon myelin endonerium complex, especially those going to the same location, bunch together and are wrapped around by perinerium, forming fascicles. The perinerium function as the blood nerve barrier. Multiple fascicles are wrapped around by the epinerium forming the nerves. The epinerium, in addition to harboring the vasal nervosum, behaves as a protective cushion layer for the nerve. So the answer to this question is B. Next question, which of the following local nerve injury type is characterized by conduction block and absence of any detectable pathology with light microscopy. A. Axonomesis B. Sutherland type 1 C. Sutherland type 2 D. None of the above Sutherland classification breaks focal nerve injury into five types. These types can be correlated with the classic sedon classification types. Neuropraxia 
can be correlated with some Derland type 1 axon misis with type 2 and neuron misis with type 3, 4, and 5. Both classifications are based on light microscopy findings, but they are linked to well-defined, although not type-specific, electrodiagnostic patterns. In this frame, I am showing a representation of the right brachial plexus from which I have removed the upper trunk. The upper trunk has the same elements than a peripheral nerve. Hence, in this frame, I have enlarged the segment, added the table with the components constituting the nerve in order to describe the different types of nerve lesions. In neuropraxia or Sunderland type 1, Light microscopy of all the elements of the nerve look normal. Yet, electrodiagnostic testing reveal abnormalities. These abnormalities consist of partial or complete conduction block, synchronized conduction slowing, or the synchronized conduction slowing. The cause of these electrical abnormalities, as well as to the clinical manifestations associated with neuropraxia, seems to be due to a dysfunction of the nodal ranvier, perhaps due to voltage channel dysfunction, that would explain when after crossing your leg, you, your foot goes to sleep for a few minutes, or to myelin dysfunction, which would explain why after some lesions, recovery takes place in about three months which is the time that it seems it takes Schwamm cells to produce enough new myelin to cover the nerve and make it functional. Axonotmesis or Sutherland type 2 on the light microscopy present abnormalities in some of the nerve elements but not in others. Nerve fibers show evidence of pathology at the level of the axons and the myelin, but the endonerium, perinerium, and epinerium are normal. This mixed pattern of normal and abnormal elements found in light microscopy in patients with axonotmesis is associated with abnormal electrodiagnostic findings. These findings would depend on the time of the study in relation to the time of the injury. These findings may consist of conduction block very early on and axonal failure a little bit later, as well as denervation potentials. Neurotmesis that fall in the category of Southern LEN 3, when studied by light microscopy, involve some nerves elements and not others. Axonal pathology is present as well as pathology involving the myelin and the endonerium. But the perinerium and the epinerium are not involved. In conjunction with this light microscopy findings, electrodiagnostic abnormalities are present and again, they depend on the age of the lesion in relation to the time of the study. These abnormalities consist of conduction block in the first few days after the lesion, 
and later on axonal failure in denervation potentials. Next, we're going to talk about neurotmesis consistent with Sutherland type 4. This type of abnormality involves most nerve elements. Axon will be affected, so will be myelin, endonerium, perineerium, but the epinerium will be spared. This light microscopy pattern will be accompanied by electrodiagnostic finding consistent of conduction block early on, quickly followed by axonal failure in denervation potentials. The last type of focal nerve injury is neurotmesis or shoulder land type 5. This type in light microscopy will show that all elements of the nerve are involved. The axons, myelin, endonerium, perineerium, and epinerium, they all will be affected. In this case, the whole nerve is severed and there is no link of continuity between any of the nerve elements. This pattern can often be appreciated by plain sight, but not always. Therefore, electrodiagnostic studies are important to diagnose it. The electrodiagnostic signature of neurotmesis Sutherland type 5 are conduction block early after deletion and a little bit later we will get axonal failure and denervation potentials. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. At which of the following locations is the ulnar nerve most often compromised? A arm, B elbow, C wrist, D none of the above. Most of us are very familiar with the biceps, triceps, brachialis muscles, as well as with the ulnar sulcus, the medial epicondyle, and the arcuate ligament. But at least I was less familiar with the relation between the ulnar nerve and the humeral and ulnar head of the flexor carpi ulnaris, which in conjunction with the arcuate ligament constitute an area of possible entrapment of the ulnar nerve. Another relation I was quite unaware of before I started doing clinical neurophysiology was the relation between the ulnar nerve and the humeral head and the radial head of the flexor digitarum superficialis. This location can also be a site of ulnar nerve entrapment. This cartoon shows the two previously mentioned sites of entrapment. The region between the flexor carpi radialis heads and the region between the flexor digitarum superficialis heads. Entrapment can also occur at the ulnar sulcus or at the medial epicondyle region. Worse still, at times, the entrapment involves all or most of these sites and therefore presents a diffuse pathology in this area.
This later type of involvement is called a poor localizable lesion. And to fix it, most often require ulnar nerve transposition, which is quite a long procedure. On the other hand, well localizable lesions to the area of the head of the flexor carpi ulnaris or between the heads of the flexor digitarum superficialis are amiable to cubital tunnel release, which is a much less invasive procedure. So the answer to this question is B. Next question, which of the following methods is not used for interoperative peripheral nervous system monitoring? A. Nerve conduction studies B. Electromyography C. Somatosensory work potentials D. Magnetomyography The methods used for interoperative peripheral nerve system evaluation are nerve conduction studies which include compound muscle action potentials compound nerve action potentials and sensory nerve action potentials. In addition, other studies used for monitoring the peripheral nervous system are electromyography, somatosensory evoke potentials, and motor evoke potentials. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following are applications for interoperative peripheral nervous system monitoring? A. Localization of injured nerve segments. B. Assess status of continuity across an injured area. C. Prevention of injury during surgery. D. All of the above. Intraoperative Peripheral nervous system monitoring helps localize injured nerve segments, assess the status of continuity across an injured area in a nerve, and is used for prevention of injury during surgery. So the answer to this question is D. Pathology can be localized along a nerve with 1 to 2 centimeter precision by the presence of A. Focal slowing of conduction velocity B. Conduction block C. Increased threshold of stimulation D. All of the above Indicators of focal pathology include Focal slowing of conduction velocity Conduction block, increased threshold of a stimulation, and failure of the nerve to respond to a stimulation. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which is the nerve being stimulated based on the pattern of responses obtained by a stimulation of the element indicated by the thunder? Interoperative monitoring can be used to identify a given nerve and avoid cutting it. This is achieved by applying a stimulus of 1.5 to 5 volts, which corresponds to a constant current of 0.2 to 2 milliamps with a duration of about 50 to 200 microseconds and seeing which muscle is activated. Based on the anatomical location of the, these branches coming off the upper proximal brachial plexus, the possibilities are that these branches are either 
a contributing branch to the phrenic nerve, the dorsal scapular nerve, or the suprascapular nerve. The electrodiagnostic pattern produced by stimulation of the middle branch is consistent with the activation of the rhomboid muscle. Since neither the phrenic nor the supraspinal muscle show an action potential. So this nerve is the dorsoscapular nerve. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Quantitative measurement of muscle function is best achieved by needle EMG. A true, B false. The electrophysiological evaluation of muscle function is typically carried out by analyzing compound muscle action potential with surface EEG and the complex multi-spike waveform generated by intramuscular needle recording. This is the appearance of a compound muscle action potential. Notice the sharp rise from the baseline and its amplitude. Notice that its amplitude is measured in millivolts. The amplitude of a compound muscle action potential or more accurately, the area under the negative wave of a compound muscle action potential are a reflection of the muscle fibers excited, which when triggered by supramaximal stimulation and in the presence of a normal neuromuscular junction and muscles corresponds to the number of functional motor axons present in the stimulated nerve. The machine specification used to analyze compound muscle action potential consists of a sweep of 1 to 10 milliseconds, a gain set at 0.5 to 5 millivolts per centimeters, depending on the size of the muscle. Compound muscle action potentials, as we previously mentioned, are typically obtained by surface recording, pot, soup, cutaneous placed needles can be used for similar functions. Interoperative muscle responses are typically recorded using intramuscular needle electrodes and produce a complex multi-spike wave. These waves are triggered by submaximal stimulation and are judged by an all or none response. The stimulus threshold at which they appear can provide some quantitative information regarding nerve and neuromuscular functions. The filters used to capture compound action potentials and the complex multi-spike waveforms are the same. The low frequency filter should be set at 20 Hz, but if the baseline is too wavy, it can be brought down to 2 Hz. The high frequency filter should be at 10 thousand hertz. High frequency filter as low as 3,000 hertz has been recommended by some. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The onset latency to compound muscle action potential and rostral nerve peak latency will decrease by going from most proximal to most distal stimulation sites in the limb. A true, B false. Using a row of stimulators separated by one centimeter on the ulnar nerve about the elbow and placing surface or subcutaneous recording electrodes on the surface corresponding to the flexor carpi ulnaris, 
activation of the most proximal stimulator indicated in this frame by the stimulator turning blue will produce an electrical volley that will travel distally and produce a compound action muscle potential with a given onset latency activation of the most distal stimulator will also produce a volley of electricity that will travel distally and produce a compound muscle action potential but the onset latency will be shorter the onset latency will be shorter because the volley has less distance to travel. Now, in order to analyze the rustily traveling volley provoked with each stimulation, I have introduced a recording electrode hook to the nerve. The distance between the closer stimulator to the cathode of the recording electrode should be no less than 5 centimeters but at times the distance has to be increased to about 8 centimeter because if it is less there will be too much contamination by the stimulus artifact. This is an example of a nerve action potential. This action potential was triggered by a proximal volley produced by the most proximal electrode, thus having to travel a relatively short distance. Then the one following a distal stimulation, as you can see in this frame. So the latency to compound muscle action potential will decrease as the stimulation moves distally in the limb, whereas the latency to the rustily placed nerve action potential will do the opposite. It is important to remember that the proximal activated volley travels throughout the sensory and motor fibers alike. And when the peak latency is being measured by the hook electrodes, both the sensory and motor axon will contribute to it. If on the other hand, the measurement is taken at the level of the onset, that is, if we measure onset latency, only the fastest conducting fibers will contribute to it. This is so because the sensory fibers coming from the muscle travel 10 to 15% faster than the fastest motor fibers. So the answer to this question is false. Next question. The usual duration of a stimulus required to produce a compound muscle action potential in an ulnar innervated muscle during surgery is A. 0 0.05 milliseconds B. 500 microseconds C. 0 0.5 milliseconds D. 1 millisecond And a stimulus in order to produce an action potential in the ulnar nerve should last about 0 0.05 milliseconds, that is 50 microseconds. The intensity should be to start at 0 0.5 milliamps. The usual intensity required is about 2 milliamps or 15 to 20 volts. According to some authors, the maximum intensity threshold to be delivered directly to a nerve should not exceed 4 milliamps, but other use as high as 7 milliamps. Reasons for needing high intensity current are bad nerves, the nerve being far or embedded in non electrically conductive tissue, 
or the presence of excessive fluid in the surgical field. When averaging, that is summating up the consecutive samples of, of waveforms is needed to improve the signal, 4 to 10 signals are usually enough. Remember that the signal enhancement increases in proportion to the square root of the trial number. So 4 trials improve the signal by 2, 9 trials by 3. The frequency of the stimulus should be about 1 every second or every or one every 200 milliseconds so the answer to this question is a next question which of the following is a benefit of bipolar stimulators a more precise b needs less intensity c less stimulus artifact d all of the above Stimulating electrodes can be monopolar, bipolar, straighter hooked, or tripolar. Bipolar stimulators are placed over the nerve. Both the cathode and the anode should be on the nerve. The cathode of the stimulating electrode should be facing the cathode of the receptors electrodes. Despite that, in clinical practice, another block is a myth. An exception to this positioning of the electrode poles is when stimulating and recording distally and proximally at the same time. In these cases, the stimulator is placed with the cathode towards the muscle, and so the anode of the stimulator will be closest to the pole of the proximally recording electrode, that is of the sensory recording electrode. But otherwise, the black-to-black -black recommendation stands. Bipolar electrodes are considered better than monopolar in some circumstances because they deliver a more localized stimulus those usually require less stimulus intensity to provoke a compound potential and they produce less shock artifacts. Yet bipolar recording electrodes are considered worse than monopolar in other situations, such as when the nerve is distant or embedded in poor conductive tissue or when there is excessive fluid in the surgical field creating a short circuit between the prongs of the bipolar stimulator. These two situations will end up producing a very low amplitude wave which will be very difficult to interpret. Now let's say a few things about monopolar stimulators. By virtue of the anode electrode being far from the cathode, these electrodes have very different qualities than the bipolar electrodes. As you can imagine, the cathode is placed on the nerve and the anode at a site, hopefully not contaminated by the activity of the nerve. They are better than bipolar if the nerve is distant, or if the nerve is embedded in poorly conductive tissue. Another situation where the monopolar electrode will be better is if there is excessive fluid in the surgical field since only one pole will be in it and the other pole, that is the anode, will be far from it. Therefore, at short circuity, it will be less likely. Monopolar electrodes tend to be worse than bipolar if precision is required or when there is a short distance between a stimulator and recording electrodes, since monopolar electrodes produce a wider field. 
the difference between the fields produced by bipolar and monopolar electrodes as well as tripolar electrodes are easily appreciated by considering brain stimulation. In this new frame, you can see the representation of a field and power lines produced by monopolar electrode in the brain. In this new cartoon, you can see a representation of the field and power lines produced by bipolar electrodes in the brain. And in this new field, you can see a representation of the fields and power line produced by a tripolar electrode in the brain. The tripolar electrode produces a more precise stimulus and requires less intensity and produce less stimulation artifacts than either the bipolar or the monopolar electrode. In this frame, I have placed three types of stimulus together. The magenta figure represents the drop in stimulus artifact that is seen with the different modalities of stimulation. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. Which of the following electrical stimulation techniques is routinely used to monitor the status of neuromuscular junction during surgery? A. Post-tetanic stimulation B. Train of 4 twist ratio C. Double burst technique D. Pulse burst technique When root stimulation fails to produce an EMG complex multifocal wave, we may be facing either a nerve injury or excessive pharmacological neuromuscular blocking. The distinction is made by stimulating distal to the site of the possible injury following relatively well-established guidelines. This guideline consists of applying four stimuli, one every second or one every 500 milliseconds and using an intensity appropriate for what we have seen before during the evaluation of the case, but it may range between 10 and 20 milliamps. The duration should range from 300 to 500 milliseconds, which is way longer than the usual stimulus duration required to produce a compound muscle action potential. But remember that what we are analyzing here is the wave captured by the intramuscular needle and not the surface recorded compound motor action potential. A good place to record for the median nerve is the abductor pollicis brevis, for the ulnar nerve, the hypothenar region, for the peroneal nerve, the tibialis anterior, and for the posterior tibialis nerve, the abductor hallucis. In this frame, I have represented four stimulus, and as you can see, the complex multi-spike waveform has decreased, but it has not disappeared in any of the four stimuli. Therefore, such a finding indicates that 75% or less of the neuromuscular junction is blocked. Hence, the amount of block does not exceed the threshold for the detection of interoperative nerve root damage. If, on the other hand, the false stimulus does not produce a wave, the blockage would probably be between 76 and 80 percent. If the third and the fourth stimuli do not produce a wave, then the blockage would be around 80 percent. If the second, third and fourth stimuli do not produce a wave, then the blockage would be about 90 percent. 
and if none of the stimuli produce a wave then the blockage will be a hundred percent when this is happening that is when less than the four stimuli produce a complex multi spike wave the surgeon should be kept appraised and he may order a reversal of neuromuscular blockage during uh, a critical phase of the surgery so the answer to this question is B. Next question. The presence of a recordable nerve action potential across the injured segment two to three months after the nerve injury had occurred indicates the presence of ongoing reinnervation, potentially obviating the need for nerve grafting. A. True. B. False. The stimulation parameters are those described when talking about compound muscle action potential and so are the reason for needing more than the usual intensity. Nerve action potential responses indicate the presence of at least several thousand moderate diameter regenerating fibers and this number of fibers correlate with clinical recovery of injury nerve in experimental animals. The amplifier filters used for nerve conduction studies consist of a low frequency filter of 20 Hz and a high frequency filter of 3000 Hz. So the answer to this question is A. Please read this question carefully and then look at the figure. Think about it for a few seconds. Stop the video if you have to and then choose one of the options. In general, nerve transposition is a more aggressive surgery than tunnel released. I hope that by now you are familiar with this figure because Mosh will be added to it in the next few minutes. I will start by adding the recording electrodes. They consist of disc for surface recording or subcutaneous needles. They are placed on top of the flexor carpulnaris to capture the potential arising from this muscle. Another set of, e of electrodes are being shown from the hypothenar region. Next, I have added a bipolar recording device. Now I like you to pay attention to the stimulating electrodes. The zero value in this case was chosen to be the medial epicondyle. The stimulation electrodes above will be labeled one that is positive one and the next one up positive two. The first electrode below the zero will be labeled negative one and so on. Now I will introduce the heading for the nerve action potential column and below the legend that goes with it. Notice that the amplitude is given in microvolts. Next I am adding the heading for the column of the compound motor action potential generated at the flexor carpi ulnaris in its legend. Notice that the amplitude in this case is given in millivolts. Now the heading that I am adding is that of the hypothenar area compound motor action potential. And you can also see that I have added the legend. Notice that the number representing the amplitude signal is smaller than the one used for the flexor carpi ulnaris, indicating that the expected potential will be lower. Now I would like you to focus your attention back to the stimulating electrodes. <laughs> 
activation of the most proximal electrode, that is electrode label minus 2, will yield a nerve action potential with a very short latency since the distance between the stimulating electrode and the recording electrode is very short. On the other hand, the activation of the same electrode will produce a prolonged latency to the compound muscle action potential from the flexor carpi ulnaris and the hypothenar area. This is so because the volley has a longer distance to travel from the stimulus to the recording electrodes. A stimulation of the next distal electrode labeled minus 1, will produce potentials with similar morphology but with slight change in latencies. Stimulation of the next electrode labeled 0 will produce similar findings. So will the potential generated by the stimulation of the next electrode labeled plus 1, of the electrode labeled plus 2, of the ele electrode label plus 3, of the electrode label plus 4, of the electrode label plus 5, of the electrode a label plus 6, and finally of the electrode label plus 7. Now I will add a new legend by the side of each column. This new legend relate to the latency difference between each subsequent stimulus. The latent horizontal extension represents 0 0.5 milliseconds. The arrow in this new frame is pointing to the peak latency of the minus 2 nerve action potential. And now to the peak latency of the minus 1 nerve action potential. The difference between these two latencies corresponds to the width of the rectangle. So in this case, the latency difference between the time it took for the nerve action potential trigger at the minus 2 electrode to reach the recording electrode subtracted by the time it took by the activity generated at minus 1 electrode to reach the same recording electrode is represented in the rectangle. In this case, it was 0 0.2 milliseconds. So it took the volley 0 0.2 milliseconds to travel one centimeter. One centimeter, as you recall, is the distance between the two stimulating electrodes. The same thinking can be applied to the motor conduction recorded to the flexor carpi ulnari, but in this case, the electricity travels in the opposite direction, but the direction does not change the distance between the electrodes, and therefore they can be judged together, that is, the duration of the transit of the nerve action potential and the duration of the transit of the flexor compound muscle action potential. So here the time it took for the electrical volley to travel the same centimeter as the one traveled by the volley producing the nerve action potential is about 4 milliseconds. And the same thinking can be applied to the recording from the hypothenar area. In this case, it took about 0 0.2 milliseconds for the electricity volume to travel the same one centimeter. This exercise that we have just applied to the interval between minus 2 and minus 1 recording can be applied to the interval between minus 1 and 0, 0 to plus 1, plus 1 to plus 2, plus 2 to plus 3, plus 3 to plus 4, plus 4 to plus 5, 
plus 5 to plus 6, and plus 6 to plus 7. Tracking the latencies by drawing an aqua line through the peak latency of the action potential and the onset latency of the compound motor potentials to the flexor carpal naris and hypothenar region, you can notice the time interval difference between them. Notice that the trajectory of the line gives you a panoramic view of the slowing between the electrodes, but it is not as precise as the computer-generated rectangles to identify the site of pathological slowing. In this case, we can conclude that the findings here illustrated indicate a well-localized lesion in the portion of the ulnar nerve between plus 1 and plus 4 which corresponds to an entrapment likely to be at the entry of the ulnar nerve into the cubital tunnel between the heads of the flexor carpi ulnaris. Such lesion is amenable to a cubital tunnel release, which most believe is a relatively simpler intervention than doing a nerve transposition. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Please take a look at this figure and choose one of the options. In this frame, I have represented significant inter electrode slowing involving a much wider area than in the previous case. The area includes the medial epicondyl region. This indicates a poorly localizable lesion likely requiring ulnar nerve transposition. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Why can an elbow localized ulnar lesion produce more slowing when motor velocity is measured to the flexor carpi ulnaris than to the hypothenar area? A. Selective fascicle involvement. B. Fibers to flexor carpi ulnaris are thinner. C. Fibers to flexor carpi ulnaris are unmyelinated. D. All of the above. Going back to the initial figure, you can see that the conduction time through the same one centimeter when analyzing it using the compound muscle nerve conduction to the flexor carpi ulnaris to the conduction time to the hypothenar region is different. This difference has two possible explanations, which are not mutually ex excluding one of the other. One explanation is the averaging or diluting factor created by the difference in distance. The other one is fascicle selectivity. In this frame, you can see the representation of a normal nerve with myelinated fibers of different sizes and unmyelinated axons distributed in fascicles. The fibers destined to the flexor carpi ulnaris are in one fascicle, and the fibers for the hypothenar muscle are in a different fascicle. In this new frame, I have represented the fibers destined for the flexor carpi ulnaris being compromised, while those for the hypothenar region being spared. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Which of the following could cause an attenuated motor action potential? A. Excessive muscle relaxation. B. Anesthesia. C. Bad nerve. D. All of the above. Absence or attenuation of compound muscle 
potential during surgery can be the consequence of excessive muscle relaxation, anesthesia, shortening of current, a stimulator being far from the nerve, bad connections, bad instrument settings, bad nerve, presynaptic neuromuscular junction or muscle. And the last but also important factor that can attenuate compound muscle action potential is the presence of non-conductive tissue between the stimulator and the nerve. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. When a stimulus is given distal to a complete axonal loss lesion and we find an abnormal compound muscle action potential amplitude and a normal sensory nerve action potential amplitude, we can conclude that the lesion occurred dash A in the prior three days, B between four and eight days, C between day nine and 13, D after 30 days. I will use this frame to describe the time course of the changes in compound motor action potential and sensory nerve action potential amplitude following a focal complete axonal loss lesion. Here I am representing a lower motor neuron innervating a muscle. I have placed the thunder at the site of the lesion. Now I have introduced surface electrode for, for the purpose of recording the motor nerve conduction and compound muscle action potential in this muscle. Now I have introduced a sensory neuron with the same type of lesion in the same place being recorded distal to the site of the injury. I have now introduced a chart with time represented in the X axis and amplitude in the Y axis. The thunder in the graph indicates the time of injury designated as day zero. Were we to do a motor and sensory nerve conduction study proximal to the lesion, on the day of the lesion and on subsequent days, as indicated by the magenta line, no motor potential will be recorded represented by the blue line adjacent to the magenta line, nor sensory nerve potentials will be recorded represented by the green line adjacent to the other two lines. Notice that the color of the lines match the color of the neurons. Now were we to stimulate the motor axon distal to the lesion, as I have depicted in this frame by adding the pink stimulator, and when doing so, daily, we will see that the amplitude will change. The amplitude of the response will vary over time as represented by the pink and dark blue lines. Now I have introduced a magenta stimulator acting upon the sensory neuron only. The amplitude evolution resulting from this daily testing is being represented by the joint magenta and green lines. I have now added an interrupted white line. This line represents 50% of the pre-injury amplitude in the nerve being tested. The implication of this line is that any potential that remains or is above 50%, that is above the 50% line, the pre-injured amplitude or control 
is considered normal. And any potential that has dropped by 50% or more or is less than 50% of the control amplitude for the given muscle is considered abnormal. Using this criteria, we can say that during the first three days after a focal complete axonal lesion, distal stump will conduct electricity normally. That is, both motor and sensory nerve conduction studies will be normal from the distal stump. From about four to eight days, the compound muscle action potential will be abnormal due to failure of the neuromuscular junction synapse, but the sensory nerve conduction and action potential will be normal since it lacks any chemical synapse. After eight days, both the sensory and motor nerve conduction studies will be abnormal because at this stage, the issue is failure of the nodal ranvier to generate action potentials. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Most partial action loss neuropathies are associated with conduction slowing. A true, B false. In this frame, you can see the representation of a normal nerve with myelinated axons of different sizes and on myelinated axons. These axons are all distributed in fascicles. Most pathologists inflict sooner and more extensive damage onto thick myelinated fibers than onto thin myelinated fibers and least damage to unmyelinated fibers. The result of such injury is the out of proportion loss of myelinated axons, thus decreasing the overall conduction of the nerve so affected. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The onset latency after direct nerve stimulation and recording reflects conduction velocity of sensory and motor fibers. This sketch represents an olar nerve surgical field, the multifocal stimulators on the nerve and the recording device most proximally. Here I have further schematized this figure to represent the nerve as the white thick line, the stimulators as the colored lines going across it, and the recording device as the hooks with the NAP. NAP stands for Compound Nerve Action Potential. The nerve conduction recordings that would be obtained with this arrangement in the normal person will show a constant compound nerve action potential amplitude and as can clearly be seen in the line graph below normal conduction between the different potentials. Remember when measuring peak latency that we are recording sensory and motor fibers. But if instead of peak latency determination, we determine onset latency, in the case of compound nerve action potential, the latency will reflect only the sensory fibers. This will be so because the sensory fibers will arrive to the cathode sooner than the motor fibers since the sensory fibers conduct 10 to 50% faster, that is 10 to 15% percent faster than any other fibers, including motor fibers. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. The onset latency after direct nerve stimulation and muscle recording reflects conduction velocity of the fastest motor fiber. Most neurophysiologists use peak latency to calculate sensory nerve conduction velocity. All neurophysiologists use onset latency to determine motor nerve conduction velocity as depicted in this frame. 
onset latency reflects the arrival and motor plate activation by the fastest motor fibers. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Electrodiagnostic testing performed proximally and distally to a lesion producing a conduction block will have a well-predicted pattern of abnormal findings. A true, B false. When monitoring proximal nerve conduction velocity in conjunction with distal motor nerve conduction velocity, a conduction block at a given site, in this example at, the, at a site indicated by the red cross, produces a very characteristic pattern of findings that consists of normal nerve conduction when the advance of the volley that creates the potential is not interrupted by the lesion. In this case, when the stimulus was generated by activation of the green or blue lines, that is, devices represented by them, in the absence of a waveform, when the advancing volley is interrupted by the lesion, as it, as it is with the magenta and aqua stimuli. When recording compound motor nerve action potential, the same principle rules, but by virtue of the different relation between the stimulating electrodes and the lesion, we will find the opposite distribution of abnormalities. So when the stimulations are distal to the lesion, the waveform will be normal. When the stimulations are proximal to the lesion, that is, that they have to cross the nerve in order to reach the muscle, no potential will be recorded. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. The findings of nerve, that is compound nerve action potential, and muscle, that is compound muscle action potential, conduction studies performed proximately and distally in two nerves, one with complete conduction block lesion and the other one with a complete axonal loss lesion, will be the same, dash, days after injury, A, during the first three B between 4 to 8, C between 1 to 8, D between 4 to 12. You have already seen this diagram, but I will mention each component again to make sure that we're clear about it. The line represents the nerve. The gold rectangle constitute the muscle from which Upon activation, we will record a compound mo muscle action potential. The gray standing rectangle represents the nerve action potential that would be present as electricity travels between the hooks. Now I will first show you the normal responses. The aqua line represents a stimulating device producing a traveling volley going towards the muscle as indicated by the blue arrow, thus producing a normal compound muscle action potential. But in addition to the volley traveling towards the muscle, the, mo the volley will also travel in the opposite direction, thus reaching the electrode hooks on the nerve and producing a compound nerve action potential that we will label NAP.
I have now introduced a second line to indicate a second stimulus. This stimulus will produce a compound motor action potential with a longer latency than the one produced by the aqua stimulus since the electricity has to travel longer to reach the muscle. But when it comes to the nerve action potential, it will have a shorter latency than the one produced by the aqua stimulus since the volley has less distance to travel. A third stimulus here is represented in green. We will notice the same results regarding latencies and distances and a force stimulus represented by the blue line which will have also the same characteristics. Notice that the motor onset latency increases from the first stimulus represented in aqua to the last stimulus represented in blue, whereas the peak latency of the nerve action potential decreases from the aqua stimulus to the blue stimulus. These changes in latency, as we have done before, can be represented in a line graph expressed as time elapsed between subsequent latencies in milliseconds. I will now use this design to talk a little bit about localization. As you can see, I have introduced a lesion in the nerve between the magenta and the green lines. This lesion will be used to explain the appearance of conduction, block, and axonal loss type lesions. Focal conduction block lesions can be partial. With partial conduction block lesions, a stimulus at the location represented by the aqua line that creates a volley of electrical activity that has to go through the lesion to reach the electrodes recording the nerve action potential will produce a tracing characterized by conduction slowing and dispersion of the negative wave. The second stimulus also having to go through the partial conduction block will produce an action potential with similar characteristics. The third stimulus, this time above the lesion, will produce a normal nerve action potential since the volley created by the stimulus does not have to travel through the lesion. The fourth stimulus will also produce a normal nerve action potential. In this frame, I have introduced a line joining all the peak latencies. As you can see, the line tilts more between the magenta and the green nerve action potentials coinciding with the interface of the normal and the abnormal waveforms. This is represented in the line chart by a longer line at that location. This line represents the traveling volley taking more milliseconds to travel between the magenta and the green nerve generated action potentials. The same principle stands for modern nerve conduction studies, but the other way around. In this case, the aqua and the magenta compound motor action potentials will be normal since the volley created by this stimuli do not need to cross over the lesion. Whereas the waveform produced by the volley traveling through the injured sites towards the muscle will have their onset latency delayed and the waveform will be dispersed. 
the site of the latency delay is easily depicted in the line chart. If instead of deletion being partial, deletion is consistent with a complete conduction block, the nerve action potentials whose generation requires for the electrical volley to cross the lesion will not be recordable, where those not needing to cross the lesion will be normal. The story for compound motor nerve action potential is the inverse. In this case, the aqua magenta potentials will be normal and have normal interval durations, but no compound muscle action potential will be elicited following the green and the blue stimulus. Axonal lesions can be partial, in which case there will be a diffuse slowing of latencies and lowering of amplitude potentials. As we will discuss in more details in the next few seconds, time matters when it concerns axonal loss lesions. At this point, I just like to mention that no signs of deterioration will occur in the first three days following the partial axonal lesion. The changes will be restricted to latency and amplitude in the compound motor action potential between the fourth and the eighth days after the injury and changes in nerve and motor compound action potentials will be present after eight days. I will dwell into these changes in the next few frames. So if you do not understand it at this point, just keep on watching the video and I hope that you will. In the case of complete axonal lesion, as we previously mentioned, with all axonal loss lesion, there will be changes and these changes will be more prominent than with partial axonal lesions. These changes will be driven by time. A complete axonal loss lesion, one to three days old, will produce normal potentials if the traveling volley does not need to go across the affected segment to reach the recording electrodes. But no potential will be generated if the volley needs to go across the lesion to create a potential. Notice that this pattern resembles the pattern produced by complete conduction block. From four to eight days, nerve action potential patterns will remain unchanged, so they will be normal. But synaptic failure will produce absence of compound muscle action potential, regardless of the location of the stimulus in relation to the lesion. So at this stage, nerve action potential pattern of a complete axonal loss lesion located between the stimulating sites of the different electrodes will be similar to the appearance of a complete conduction block lesion in the same site. Finally, after eight days, the Norofran VR failure will take over and no potential will be generated regardless the location of the lesion in relation to the stimulating electrodes or whether we're doing nerve compound action potential or muscle compound action potentials. So the answer to this question is A. The findings of nerve conduction studies, CNAP, performed proximally and distally in two nerves, 
one with a complete conduction block lesion and the other one with a complete axonal loss lesion will be the same for the first eight days after the injury. A true, B false. Since node of Renvier failure does not occur till eight days after a complete axonal loss lesion, nerve action potential, which is only dependent on it, will stay active for about eight days. Whereas compound motor action potential, which is dependent on synaptic transmission, will fail by day four. Between one and three days, both nerve action potential and compound muscle action potential will both be normal. But this possibility was not presented as an option in this question. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. The findings of motor nerve conduction studies CMAP performed proximately and distally in two nerves, one with a complete conduction block lesion and the other one with a complete axonal loss lesion will be the same for the first dash days after the injury. 8, 3, B8, C12, D30. When a lesion occurs between stimulating electrodes, the compound muscle action potential produced by a complete conduction block will be the same as the one produced by a complete axonal loss lesion during the first three days. So the answer to this question is A. Next question. Electrodiagnostic studies performed distal to the injury site and six days after the injury, demonstrating normal nerve conduction, that is CNAP, and abnormal compound muscle action potential is consistent with A, partial conduction block, B, complete conduction block, C, complete axonal loss lesion, D, none of the above. In this question, the studies were done distal to the lesion. As you can see, the location of the lesion is indicated by the arrow. In a lesion with such a location, since all studies are done distal to it, no electrodiagnostic abnormality will be present in the first three days. It does not matter if the lesion will evolve into a conduction block or axonal failure. But after three days in those with axonal loss lesion, the compound muscle action potential will become abnormal. And after eight days, the nerve action potential will join in and also become abnormal. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. Focal axonal loss lesion close and far from the muscle being tested follows the same temporal evolution, A true, B false. In this example, the focal axonal loss lesion is far from the flexor carpi ulnaris, and it took four days for the compound muscle action potential to become abnormal. In this example, the focal axonal loss lesion is 
close to the flexor carpal lunaris, and it took two days for the compound muscle action potential to disappear. So, the closer the lesion is to the muscle, the sooner the compound muscle action potential will disappear. So the answer to this question is B. Next question. Probing the electrical field with regular sharp instrument will produce A. Fasciculation potentials B. Complex repetitive discharges C. Fibrillations D. Neurotonic discharges this is a representation of a neurotonic discharge arising from the orbicularis oculi trigger by touching the nerve. And here, from the right anterior trivialis, neurotonic discharges consist of very fast repetitive motor unit potentials recorded from intra muscular electrodes during interoperative monitoring in response to mechanical thermal or chemical irritation of the nerve. They need to be distinguished from motor unit action potentials that may also arise from irritation, but they are single usually and semi-regular and tend to be bilateral in most cases. Neurotonic discharges also need to be distinguished from artifacts arising from electrocauterization. The frequency of this type of discharges is usually in the 60 Hz. Neurotonic discharges also need to be distinguished from movement artifacts, something that is quite easy because of the configuration of movement artifacts is rather peculiar and specific. So the answer to this question is D. Next question. These findings from continuously free running EMG recorded suggest root irritation. Please look at this frame and decide whether you think is A L1 B, L3, C, L5, D, S2. Neurotonic discharges are rising from the tibialis anterior muscle are likely to be due to a problem related to the fifth lumbar root. So the answer to this question is C. Next question. If you increase the stimulus too much, you may get false positive responses. A true, B false. With complete axonal loss injury, once the primary lesion has produced axonal failure, and if the stimulus is applied with the usual intensity and duration and restricted to the nerve, there will be no potentials created. On the other hand, if the stimulus is increased too much or the stimulus is applied to another conducting structure, a potential will be recorded. Most of the time, this recording will be due to emphatic transmission through non nervous tissue, but it can also be that the activity may be transmitted through abnormal nerve tissue. So once you find a stimulus intensity and duration, do not change it unless you're trying to determine the relation between intensity and response. If you increase it, you may find what is not there. So the answer to this question is true. Next question. Small stimulus intensities increases are used to determine focal pathology. 
a true b false one of the indicators of focal pathology is an increased threshold for stimulation if at one distal level of a nerve it takes 5 milliamps to trigger a good size compound muscle action potential and you move the electrode a short distance proximally and the same intensity does not produces a good size compound motor action potential but then if you increase the intensity of the stimulus you get a good looking potential you may be dealing with a conduction block so the answer to this question is a next question in the presence of a negative response following nerve stimulation the first step should be to increase the intensity or duration of the stimulus a true b false if you find no response in a nerve check a good one to confirm that it is not a problem with the stimulator so it is important to confirm all negative responses with a positive response so the answer to this question is false next question which of the following statements is not true a normal sensory nerve action potential can occur in complete nerve root avulsions b tourniquets should be deflated for at least 30 minutes before performing nerve action potential responses c mechanical trauma is less likely to evoke neurotonic discharges from an abnormal motor nerve D. Cold water irrigation does not produce neurotonic discharges. This frame is a representation of rootlets joining to form roots, roots joining to form a spinal nerve, and a spinal nerve dividing into dorsal and ventral rami. As it could be expected, in a normal situation, distal nerve stimulation will yield normal sensory nerve action potential and normal compound motor action potential in the presence of a complete avulsion of the ventral and dorsal rami since the sensory axons have not been severed from the dorsal cannulum cells sensory nerve conduction will be normal this is not the case for motor axons and therefore compound muscle action potentials will be abnormal if tourniquets are being used to take blood pressure during surgery they should be deflated for at least 30 minutes before performing nerve action potential responses because thick myelinated axons are very sensitive to hypoxia and ischemia cold saline produces when in contact with nerve neurotonic discharges so the answer to this question is d next question the longer neurotonic discharges last after removal of a mechanical stimulus the worse the nerve injury is a true b false there are three important facts about neurotonic discharges that i want to mention to you the first one is that healthy and pathological nerves behave differently mechanical trauma is more likely to produce neurotonic discharges in normal than in abnormal nerves the second thing I wanted to make sure that you know before I finish this talk is that neurotonic discharges stop once the stimulus is removed if no significant injury has occurred to the nerve.
And the third thing is that minimum mechanical trauma produces neurotonic discharges for a brief period of time. If the injury is worse, the discharges will be longer. And with severe injury, they would last even for seconds or minutes. And when neurotonic discharges persist after the irritant is removed, the injury to the nerve tends to be very severe. So the answer to this question is true. Thank you.